C'est bon? OK. Good. En set. Um, okay, yeah, so uh, as I said, software engineer for Elastic, uh, working, uh, specifically working on the Logstash team. So we have Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana, and now Beats. Um, and uh, it's all open source uh, software development. Uh, so uh, all of my work and our work, uh, generally speaking, uh, happens on uh, GitHub. So um, um, just a little word to say that. Uh, I want this to be interactive. Um, it, it's been a very short notice uh, for, for this, uh, this uh, presentation, so uh, there's, there's, I didn't have time to prepare a lot. I prepared just a few slides. It's basically bullets for, for, for me to remember what I want to talk about. And I'm going to switch back to different pages and, uh, and uh, the Git book and stuff to see some diagrams if we need to. So uh, um, this is not a finished uh, product, so uh, uh, please you know, ask question or, or, or comment, uh, and uh, we're going to go, um, we're going to take it from there. Um, okay, so like I said, um, I'm not a Git expert. There's only one Git expert, and it's Linus Torvalds. Um, when, you, uh, when you search, uh, you have a problem with Git. Uh, you search uh, uh, Stack Overflow. You can have, like, 30 different answers for the, the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, it's very confusing. Uh, internally, uh, I, there's some uh, mail threads sometime about how we should, you know, whatever, do branching strategies and stuff like that, merge and debase and stuff. And uh, you can literally, you know, prepare some popcorn and look at the thread because it's endless. And everybody has, like, like their own idea on how it should be better, it should be done, and all that. So, I mean, there's, there's always many different ways to do uh, what you want to do. Yes. Um, so, I think the bottom line is that if you use a lot of Git, it's, I think it's important to understand how it works internally. And once you grasp that, it helps you take better decision after and maybe better understand uh, what the source of the problem or what you're trying to solve exactly. Now, I, uh, like I said, maybe some of you are, are, are more advanced than myself. Um, typically, when you use Git for a while, you tend to uh, to like use the same same tools and commands, um, and you build like like your own tool set around that. Then you take some shortcuts, and you have your your way of doing things. And that's basically what I do. Uh, so sometimes doing a talk like that allows you to go back a little bit and say, okay, yeah, that's true. I have to relearn that, or I have to, to read that. But so anyway, hopefully it's going to be useful for you guys. Um. Yeah, so a um, few, a few definitions about, uh, about Git. So first, I'm, okay, first I want to go into the details of how the Git repository is structured. What, what are the, the different objects that are creating or making um, a Git repository? Talk about uh, uh, different strategies uh, for merging, what are you know, branches and all that, merging, rebasing, stuff like that. I want to talk about um, uh, the GitHub and the relation with, the, with Git and GitHub, uh, the different workflows that you can have. I'm going to present to you the workflow that we use with Elastic, so it can be useful. Again, there's as many workflows as you know, people want to create them. Uh, very, very you know, uh, complex one, very, very easy one, like the GitHub workflow, for example. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that, and, uh, and that's it. So um, in Git, there are different type of uh, Base objects. Uh, it starts at the lowest level uh, with blobs. So it's, it's the most uh, basic data type in Git. So a blob is essentially uh, um, a, a file that contains the, 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 the file contents of what you put in the repository. It's a binary format. I won't go into the details of, of this binary format, but it's a very clever format for packing. We call it a pack file. So um, I think that the, the, what we have to understand is that there's some, some uh, very um, uh, interesting ways in Git to actually pack those files 
and, and the deltas within those files. But in Git, um, it's not really, uh, uh, so it, it is a revision control system. It doesn't really work by, by accumulating a series of deltas to reconstruct your files. It does that, but it's really essentially like hidden from yourself, from you in, in what they call blobs. So, and again, it's a binary format. You don't really uh, have access. You can, you can introspect those blobs, but this is something that you don't have access uh, or, or you are exposed to uh, when you work with it. But I'm going to show you a little bit later a diagram that, that uh, shows the relation with uh, you know, the commits and the different, uh, different objects in the Git. On top of the blobs, there's a tree object. A tree object is a little bit like a directory. Uh, it has pointers. So there's a tree object that represents each directory uh, in your repository. So when you create your commit files and you create subdirectories and you add files and stuff, it creates what they call tree objects, which actually points to blobs. And the blob contains the, the, the content of the, the file that you added to your, uh, your directory. And so basically, the, 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 each commit in, in Git points to a tree object, to the root tree object of your uh, repository, so that within each commit, you can always reconstruct the complete directory hierarchy of your, uh, of your repository. And this is very important to understand. So each commit points to the root object at the time of that commit. And you can always reconstruct completely the, the repository path and the path under to structure the repository at this commit time. So the commit object, obviously, this is what we manipulate as, as a user. So we add commits, and it points to a single tree object, which is the root of the, uh, the uh, of your repository for that commit at that time. It includes some metadata, of course, the, the, uh, the author name, the committer name um, and the uh, and the parent parent commit, so it can it can have a single parent commit, or it can have multiple parent commits if it's a merge commit. I'm going to show show talk about that a little bit later. Now there's uh, tag objects and um, and uh, references. Um, so a tag object and a reference actually are are kind of aliases to commits they, they point. So it gives it allows you to give a name to act to point to actually not an actual commit. So a branch, for example, is a reference to a commit. A branch is only a name that exists in the dot git uh, repository structure that contain a pointer to a specific commit. And a commit is always uh, already always represented as a SHA1 or SHA1 hash. So far, so good. Okay. Okay. So there's always um, a one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence between uh, a set of changes in the repository and a commit, and the commit is the only method to introduce a change uh, in the repository, and all changes must be represented by a commit. So, like I said, a commit object points to a tree object. And that tree objects can point to different tree objects and blob objects idea. And the blob objects actually represent the, the, the file, the complete files that you add in your uh, uh, repository. Now, with this, I will show you the diagram.
Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So this is um, okay. so this is the diagram. So three objects, dots, and the components. Um, there is all the stage in here we have a which represents um, the next view of the three object or the root three objects that you're gonna create when you're gonna create or push or you're gonna commit uh, your work. So on the staging area and the staging area you see the status when you say there's in there and when you get had as the, uh, the, the file in the index and so on. Uh, so basically you have a, a working area community with two files out of the bar. Uh, and uh, so this is what you have now. So so the index has this key object which is a triangle points uh, two files the bar here which has the box. And uh, so you have your uh, master, which points to the, the first commit. First commit points to the three objects, and the two objects point to uh, the two blocks. Right. So this is this is your uh, structure at that time. Okay. Now what you do is that you uh, you actually did file one and change it like that. Okay. So at that time. That name changes in terms of the index and the, the object store, the repository. So, when, what happens when you actually commit that file? Um, so, first, that new file content is added to the, uh, uh, as, as a new block because it has new content. Right? And then, when you do get add to that file, that's what you have to the block to that file. And, uh, and it's going to modify the staging of the index for the point of file one, I should point that's the block. So you get add a new file for those changes. But the object store itself didn't change. So master still points to that first commit to that original. Yeah. So now what happens when you do the git commit for those changes? Well, this new tree address becomes the new group tree address. And that's so then in your commit, here it is created and points to that new tree object, which was in the state of the domain. Right? So now it's moved into the point to it. And, and this tree object now points to the previous bar and power. So about two power one. And the new commit that you added points to the previous commit, which points to the previous of the you know, both lines. So this shows that every commit, as it goes, has a complete view of the, the repository structure. And you can always reconstruct your full repository from any commit. Very powerful. So far, so good? Okay, so um, commit is, is always referenced with this hash value, which is uh, S -H -S -H a one hash. And uh, there's, so there's two ways to, uh, to reference uh, a commit. There's the explicit way through this hash, 
and there's an implicit weight through a name, like a branch name or like that. And uh, so there's, there's, there's a name that we use, uh, often it's head, in capital letters. And the head simply points to the latest commit of your current, current branch. That's all. So head is actually a file that contains only a hash value. And it's essentially the same for all branches. So when you have a branch name, the branch contains only the commit value, the commit hash, uh, to, the, to that, that uh, branch head. And that's all. So that's why we say that branching in Git is very, very cheap. It doesn't have to replicate anything. It just creates a new file with a new hash value that points to the right thing. That's all. So essentially, this is very different from uh, you know, uh, biggest C systems like SVN, where it actually went with branching. It, was, it actually needed to copy all the content, and which was very, very costly. OK, um, so I'm going to show you. So I think this is pretty clear, but uh, uh, you see that the repo commit history is uh, represented uh, by a graph, and it's a directed acyclic graph. Um, show you an example. Now, my page numbers are all bored because I size the window and calculate the pages. But so this this is a graph. This is a graph with the, the, the you know showing like the, the, the tree objects and the blobs and so on. This is not something that we actually need uh, to work with. Like I said, this is this is in hidden and behind. And the only thing that we typically use is, is the commit object. And uh, so so you know this this is what the repo looks like after a few commits. Starts with the initial commit, and then the second commit. Eventually, a branch is created. That branch is tr seventy, and then you add a commit to that branch, and so on. And you see that that branch, this is the head of the branch, and there's only a pointer to a specific. Eventually, a merge happens, and the commit merge is created here, and that merge has two parents. And uh, so this is. So a commit could have more than that, but I think it's pretty rare. Maybe like the two ways, not two matches. But personally, that doesn't happen. Um, so you see the you know, three branches here, that branch, master. So this is what it looks like. OK. Um, so I uh, so I talked a little bit about the uh, the index or the staging area. So we know that uh, to view the status of, uh, of the, the staging area as the status, you add objects to it. Uh, you can remove. Uh, I mean, you don't remove from staging, but uh, Git RM or Git move uh, stuff in your repo is going to be uh, um, it's going to be uh, um, transferred into the, the the staging area. Also, so these commands actually affect the staging area. Uh, OK, so branches and tags, like I said, these are very lightweight. There's just references to commits. Um, what are the difference between uh, branches and tag? Basically, it's just a convention. I mean, both are the same. It's, it's just a reference to a commit at the end, right? Uh, slight uh, distinctions with tags. So we have two types of tag. There's the lightweight tag and the, uh, the other tag, whatever it is. Uh, so, uh, so basically, like with tag is a little bit like a branch, it's only a reference to commits. But the other tags is that you can add uh, an author, you can have a date, uh, and, and these tags can be signed. So, so we contain more metadata, but it's essentially the same thing. Uh, so it, it's 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 convention. Typically, a branch is going to be dynamic. This is something that's going to, going to add to it, and the tag is 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 you want to represent state and time, so it's going to stay static. So this is the convention that we use. Uh, 
Um, so when you create a branch, like I said, it's very lightweight. It's just going to create an, a, a file in .git refs heads and the branch name and contains only the, uh, the, the hash of the commit that it points to uh, on the head. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, a little bit about merging. No questions? It's clear for everyone. Good. Um, okay, merging. So there's there's uh, basically two ways um, to merge, uh, or two things that can happen when you merge. Um, there's going to be a, a fast forward merge, and uh, there's going to be a merge that produces a merge commit. Now, there's uh, so I'm going to explain a little bit uh, what both are. and. Uh, Take a diagram here. So, by the way, uh, this is a very good book here. Uh, let me show you. Okay, so uh, yeah, version control would get uh, O'Reilly, pretty good. Uh, Explain very well the, the different concepts. And um, so, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so there's the site hackers guide to it, which is pretty good too. Um, so, like I said, I, I I'm gonna switch from the contents to okay. So let's talk about uh, a merge situation uh, where uh, where it's going to create a fast forward commit, a fast forward merge, and a merge commit. Uh, so let's say that we have uh, this structure here. So um, so we have our repo master, two branches, each branch. Okay. Now. We simply want to merge hotfix in master. This is very easy because when you're going to say merge, you want master, you say git merge uh, hotfix. You're going to realize that it's, it's very uh, link to, uh, to uh, hotfix. So it only has to adjust the master uh, master branch to actually point that. And so, this commit here becomes a new master. So that's what we call fast forward. There's nothing to do. Just move. So the reference to, uh, to to the commit to the next commit. That's it. That's fast forward. That's the simplest way. The cleanest way. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So the the they're picking up the the sound. All right. Um. Now, master points at D, and uh, which was the, the hotfix uh, uh, branch. Now we want to merge the feature branch. So what happened when you're going to do when you're going to you do the merge? Like right? now, let's let's assume that there's no merge conflicts for now. Um, so. When you when you do the merge, um, a git is going to create a new commit, which is going to be the merge commit, which is the new um, uh, e commit here, which will point to the feature branch commit and also the last commit of master and move master there. Right. So you're going to see that this merge commit now points to the the, the last master head. And the branch that you just merge. Does that make sense for everyone? Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. So you merge you merge your your feature branch into uh, into master, but it cannot be fast forward, right? Because because master is here, and there's no direct path from uh, you know from 
So what it's going to do is it's going to take the content and it's going to it's going to merge it. And if there's no merge conflict, then it's going to create a new commit. We can it's going to point to a new tree object with the new content that has been merged, and then and then point to both. So what does it it does is it allows you to keep a history of the branch the branch that you merge. So looking at the history, you can actually see that at this point, what was merged was coming from a branch. Now, it can be desirable or not. Some people don't like to have to have the merge commits because it kind of pollutes the history of your uh, of your register. Um, and and I mean, both sides are understandable. So, so personally, I don't like to have merge commits. I prefer to to do rebase. And if there's a lot of commit, I, I'm going to squash and talk about that. But this is a personal preference. Uh, but you know, it's different philosophies of using it. Yeah, it's not linear, and, and it's creating all these these bubble branches and history. And uh, yeah, basically, it's it's like it's like a useless commit. It's like a commit that. So, so personally, I prefer to actually, you know, when you have a branch, it's finished, it's gone through uh, the review, then you just take all the commits, you squash them into one, and then you fast forward merge it to uh, to master. That's that's a preference. Um, we're going to talk about that in terms of a little bit later. But that that's totally debatable, and uh, and you know. You, you can you can prefer the other way around, and that, that's totally fine. And lots of people prefer that way too. Okay, so we've seen both both ways of merging. Fast forward and uh, merge commit. Okay, now rebasing. This is a little bit of a dark side of Git. There's a lot of people saying rebasing. So it's not really evil uh, as long as you understand what you're doing. Um, so rebasing actually rewrites history. Um, so the one golden rule when rebasing is that you don't want to rebase on the branch that is shared with people. So you can, all, you can always do that on local branch. But if it's a branch that is shared, you don't want to rebase because you're going to create bad surprises for other people. Are gonna, Update the, the the branch because you actually rewrite the story, so you want to avoid that at all cost. But rebasing locally, uh, it can be very useful for different reasons. Um, so I'm going to show you a little di diagram of rebasing. So I'm going to talk uh, talk about the rebase for. Changing history and then squashing after. Okay. So let's imagine uh, simple uh, again. So you've got your master uh, bits A B C D. Now you create a branch, my branch. Uh, so create commits uh, e, e and F. Now, if you want to merge that into master, obviously you're gonna you're gonna have. Imagine that there's there's, there's other stuff. Uh, you're gonna have to uh, uh, create a merge commit. And if you want to avoid that, um, or if you want to keep up with master, which you know. Your colleagues are going to add commits to it, and then you develop your branch, and you want to make sure that there's there's no conflicts, or you want to keep up with the work that the other people are, are committing to master. What you do is that you can rebase. So, rebasing is actually just replaying your own commits on the new head of master. Okay, so I'm going to take your commits here and your branch, so ENS, and we're going to update. The master, and you're going to replay those commits on top of uh, the head of the master. So you actually move up your branch to the top of master, right? 
Now, this is going to create new commits. And this is why we say that we uh, write history. It ch let's change, but yeah, rewrite or change the history. Um, so this is so this is very useful because and this is something that I do personally is uh, when I develop a branch, I develop and I work on a branch. Every so often, I'm going to rebase against master, make sure that I pick up the, the, the changes that that my changes result the conflicts, make sure that it works. And when's going to be the time to actually merge? And decide you know, if I'm gonna squash or not. Squash or not doesn't make a difference, but I'm gonna, you know, make sure I rebase, and then after that, do the, uh, the the merge. So I know it's gonna be always a fast forward merge, so that I don't have to create. If I have multiple commits, then it's a decision if I want to have a merge commit or not, and I can actually use the no no fast forward, because by default it's gonna create a fast forward, but you can actually force Git. To create a merge commit, even if it can fast forward with the dash node fast forward uh, command. So, is anyone rebasing in their their workflow, or not really? Or you, okay, um, yeah, you you should you should uh, you should try that. You should uh, use that. Um, of course, it always depends on you know how many people are working on on master. So if you're the only one, there's no point, right? But if you have multiple people, like like in a team, like I, I'm working with, I mean, people just keep on you know uh, merging into uh, into master. So you want to keep up. So we have to do that. Yeah. 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 I don't, like, I that yeah. I tend to yeah. So basically, basically, so squashing, so squashing is a rebase operation. And what it allows you to do is to actually merge together commits into one or more, but typically you want to create one. So the, the end game is to, for me, is to have like a clean history. When you look at you know, GitLab and you look at master, then instead of having, you know, because when I, when I work, I have like branches that can have like 100 commits. And sometimes it's like work in progress commits. You say, oh, okay, commit that. Yes, blah, blah, blah. It's like useless. You can have like tens of commits that, are, that are, you know. And so you want to clean that up. And one way is to actually rebase. So you take all those commits and you squash them into one. And this is, you know, this is what you're going to actually commit to master. Uh, so you can use rebase just to make sure that you keep up with master. And eventually you can use rebase to squash and then uh, use that to. Uh, So okay, so for me the rule is this. So so if you're the only, typically you want to have a commit that's that's you know, commits that that concern only one aspect of it, right? So sometimes you, you may want to squash into multiple commits because there's like two or three very distinct things that it is doing. So you, you got to choose. You're gonna. Um, the other thing that you think about is that sometimes if you have multiple authors on the branch. Then you don't necessarily want to squash into one commit because you're going to be the, uh, the author, the other authors, you know, because the author of that that, 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 that is squashing or the first author commit because you're like squashing into the commit, right? So you may lose the uh, uh, the authors. So what I do typically is that I'm going to, create, I'm going to keep at least one commit per author uh, and and merge like that authors commit together. So that that we can actually know who the author of the code was, uh, because the, we cannot have multiple authors per commit in Git. This is for me. I think it's a flaw, but that's the that's way it works. Um, okay. So, uh, like I said, 
it's very important not to rebase a public uh, branch. Uh, that's that's the only rule. Because if you do that, then you're gonna you know, put put the branch on fire for your your purpose. Okay, so that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about Git. Uh, now I want to talk about, about GitHub. So I don't know if you have questions, specific questions you'd like to, to discuss or ask about Git. Yeah. The what? The tag signing? Oh, yeah. So it only signs the tag. And and uh, and and this tag is going to reference the commit, and the commit is going to you know reference to the the, the 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 tree objects, you know, to everything be behind it. So, um, but personally, I've never used tag signing, so I'm I'm not entirely sure. But but I'm pretty sure that the signature is only contained in the tag; it doesn't propagate to any uh, any other objects. No, yeah, it's only specific to the tag. Questions? Okay. Um, so GitHub, uh, obviously, most of you uh, use GitHub. Uh, so it's 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 the teamwork around Git, um, social coding. It's uh, great for you know asynchronous asynchronous work, um, and it's basically uh, using. Uh, you know, force branching and pull requests. There's also issues, but uh, let's see that. So, um, so what I think what makes uh, uh, GitHub so useful is really the pull request, and uh, we use uh, we use pull requests, and I've, I've used GitHub, especially at first. Many different ways, and uh, and really grown to actually use uh, the pull request as as one of the main interaction I have with the uh, GitHub. Of course, there's issues, uh, and and a lot of the community uh, you know interact with us through through issues because they, they post you know, they, they, they submit the bug reports and stuff like that. But uh, within the team, we all work through pull requests, and the pull request actually serves as a tool to do. Uh, code reviews for us, and uh, and uh, uh, as, uh, you know, in our workflow, uh, we typically need at least two reviewers uh, to sign off the pull request. Actually, just give the uh, look good to me. Uh, so we need two people to actually do that, and and normally this is good enough uh, to actually merge and master. Um, so pull requests are code reviews for us. There are code discussion. Um, it can be uh, simply a feature discussion, so you can actually, you know, come up with work in progress or a very uh, a prototype of something. You know, put it out there very early through a pull request. Ask comments about it. Um, it can be, you know, for for strategy, and 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 the the base of our discussions are uh, through the pull request, and this is very powerful. Because you keep it a history of all those conversations and uh, the request, and uh, yeah, and 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 it's very well done to actually uh, to actually discuss around the code. So a pull request is, is essentially a discussion for us. Uh, eventually, you know, you want to end with, with some some code that's going to be merged, but uh, sometimes. And a lot of times, pull requests are just closed because uh, you know we decided to, to move on, or we, you know we think it was such a good idea or whatever. So, um, yeah. So basically, this is this is what we use to do um, to do code review. So I I think it's a very uh, very good way or a very uh, good strategy when you start a project project to always use pull requests. To commit code in, uh, in your repository. So, of course, when you're you know, one, two, three person, you tend to directly merge your stuff. But I think it's a good habit to actually do that through a uh, pull request, so you can actually 
have a discussion and have exposure to, on that code. And, and depending on you know the amount of overhead that you want or you don't want, then this can be you know simply just you know okay yeah that's good that looks good then merge it. Um, so like I said for us we do have like a, a workflow in place where we want to have like multiple reviewers to go through the code, but uh, that's 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 our own uh, uh, workflow. Um, yeah. And working, you know, with with, uh, with GitHub and, and through pull requests is it's great because this is all asynchronous. So you know, you just work when you can on the pull request. You can comment on it. Uh, you can create pull requests. You get notification by emails. Um, you know, everyone has visibility to that. So anyone in in your organization, your startup, can actually comment on it. Uh, depending, you know, how deep it is in the code or not, it can be uh, it, it can be a, a document, it could be a strategy document or something like that. And like I said, the history is always kept, so this is uh, this is really valuable. Um, now, the the issues um, in GitHub are useful uh, mainly because this is. Um, this is what the users interact with. So when you when have an open source community, this is what they, they, they use, the issues, they create issues, they, they follow up on issues and stuff like that. It is a little bit maybe too simplistic, uh, but it gets the job done. One of the, one of the main drawbacks, personally, I think, is the, the, the milestone feature. It doesn't work well because you cannot assign multiple milestones to an issue. I think this is... I don't know why they didn't fix that. Uh, I think it makes sense just to say, you know, I have an issue and, and this or a pull request and this should be you know, assigned to multiple milestone. And the milestone is really arbitrary in, in GitHub. So you can choose a milestone being a data, it can be a version, it can be a, you know, whatever feature. So uh, I think it's normal to be so. So we actually drop the usage of milestone altogether and just use tags. So we have tags for, for you know, Assigning different purpose to, to an issue, and we have like milestone tags, so we can have multiple milestones. Um, so we actually you know, use the milestone, but within tags, it works. Um, okay, now in terms of workflow, uh, there's there's many many workflows, and um, so you know the, there's there's a few that are very popular. So there's the GitHub workflow. Which is basically saying uh, everything in master must work and must be deployable. So this is the context of a web app or a site. Uh, and 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 when you create a branch, you make sure that you know it's going to work. And when you merge it, it should be always deployable in master. And so that's it. So the base unit uh, unit of work is, is master, and and you create feature branch, and then eventually you merge, and it's going to be deployed. That's a very, very simple uh, uh, workflow. There's uh, the Git flow uh, workflow. And I'm not going to go into that because it's, it's a bit more complex. So there's like uh, staging branches and stuff like that. So there's, there's many branch, branching strategy. Uh, I'm going to show you the, the workflow that we use at, at Elastic. I think it's pretty simple. Um, and I'm going to show you a, a tutorial that I have. I created a GIST with it. Uh, I'll, I'll, I can send you the link or show you the link to it um, uh, with a step-by-step uh, -step procedures to, to how to use the, the flow. Um, so basically, the workflow that we use at Elastic is, uh, so we're, we're product-centric, so we have products. It's not web apps, so the concept of always be deployable is, does not really apply. So for us, the master branch is the latest and greatest in terms of uh, you know the development features. So it may not be usable production-wise. Typically, we, we, we want it to be as stable as possible so that people can actually work on it and develop on it and it's stable. Uh, but it may not, not be good for production use. So it's not the same philosophy as having you know, master as, as always working in the context of a web application that you want to be able to release any time. Um, but we use release branches. So for example, if we have um, version 1, or 1.1, we're going to create a new branch. 
So for example, branch 1.1. This is going to be the release branch. And once it's good and released, we're going to tag it 1.1. And we're going to have always have a 1.x. So for version 1 line, same for version 2, for example, we're going to have like version 2.3 and version 2.x. So within that version line, we, we, uh, we're always going to, uh, you know, create bug fixes or features. Bug fixes for the current release version. So for example, if one that one is released, then we're going to only create bug fixes to that one that we're going to also include in the one that X and one that X is going to be the branch for the next version on that version line. And eventually we're going to force. So if we decide to do a 1.2, we're going to create a new branch out of the 1.x branch, create 1.2, 1, 1 finish it up, and then release it, tag it, and so on. So it's pretty simple. So typically what we do is when we develop, we develop against master, unless it's a very, very you know, version-specific bug fix that we need to do. In that case, we decide to merge it in master also or not. Maybe it's, it's something that doesn't apply to the, the latest and greatest. Um, but typically, when we when we merge something, we have to merge it in two or three places, like master, the, the version branch, and maybe the next release, you know, one that X branch, and so on. Um, and this is where rebasing and splashing actually uh, can be very useful because when when you have a branch for a feature or a bug fix that you need to actually merge into multiple branches, it's easier to actually do cherry picking. So just take that commit. So when you watch, you have the example of one commit. You just cherry pick that commit and then branch. So this is another reason why squashing can be useful. It's, it's easier to actually cherry pick uh, and put a commit in, uh, in the branch. Um, OK, so let's take a look at that workflow. Step by step. Okay. Um, so, uh, for example, so I'm, I'm talking here about your uh, user uh, project. So this is a you know, whatever repo that you want to work in, uh, work on. You, uh, you first you fork it uh, locally in GitHub. So uh, you create, you end up with that project on your uh, username. Uh, uh, GitHub account. And the first thing that you want to do is uh, the configure repos. There's basically two, two different naming strategies for repos. Uh, the one I prefer is the, the, the GitHub way, is that uh, when you clone your own repo locally, this becomes uh, origin. It's name origin. The remote name for that repo is origin. Now, since that repo is a fork from an upstream repo, then I, I add with git remote add an upstream. So I name it upstream for the actual upstream repo, right? Which is the original one. So the original one was like user project and origin is my own. So it's my own copy of that, that project, which is in, you know, Collins of Fana project. Now I have two remotes, origin and upstream. I think it makes sense. It's, it's easy to understand. So if you want to pull in changes from the original one, you just pull from, from upstream and so on. Now, another way to, to create or to name your remotes is to actually use symbolic names uh, or descriptive, descriptive uh, names and to use actually your name. So for example, my name on GitHub is Kalei Sopana in one word. So instead of naming it origin, I name it Kalei Sopana and, and to use the username for the upstream name. So the uh, yeah. So so it's, it's it's I mean it's it's another way to actually make the remotes. It's up to you to decide. Personally, I, I prefer um, origin and upstream. Um, okay. So uh, yeah. 
So this is a nifty uh, uh, alias if you ever need it. So if you work with, uh, with uh, pull requests and you, if you can test a pull request locally, you can use this alias. I'm going to go through what it does exactly, but it allows you to do uh, a git PR uh, and the number of the pull requests, and it's going to actually create a local branch with that pull request code. This is very useful. So you can actually pull in uh, you know, someone else's pull request code uh, locally, test it, and uh, maybe add commits to it. Um, another useful is the uh, uh, cache. Um, so this is useful if you do um, uh, a lot of uh, rebase and merges on very long uh, branches. This is a cache that's going to remember uh, uh, those merge conflicts. So if if you happen to always have the rebase and merge conflicts, the same one is going to remember how to uh, to actually uh, uh, solve this. And uh, yeah, it can be useful. OK, so typically what I do is uh, um, I'm going to work on my branch. So if I have a, a bug fix or a feature, uh, I'm going to create, uh, I'm going to prefix with feature of fix, uh, whatever branch uh, name I want to give it. It can be a fixed slash the, and an issue number. Typically, a branch is going to always be associated. You know, a branch that's going to become a PR is going to always be associated with an issue. We, don't, then we, we uh, try to keep that one -to -one relationship between both, <clears throat> so that you know you have an issue describing the problem, and you have the, the pull request that actually solve that problem. So, fixed slash the number, or it can be a name, whatever. Um, so. You know, normal work on that branch. Uh, you commit some stuff, and um, what you do is when you're uh, ready to actually generate the pull request, the first thing I do, like I said, is um, fetch the the upstream uh, master. So git fetch upstream, and I'm going to merge it into uh, uh, the local master, and I'm going to re rebase my branch against master just to make sure that I pull in the latest changes. Uh, if there's conflicts, I'm going to resolve them, and I'm going to be clean against master at that point. Now, the only thing that you uh, need to do is to push your branch, uh, uh, your updated branch, uh, to your origin, to your own repo. And if you rebase, you need to put the dash uh, force because you actually change history, and uh, GitHub uh, won't let you actually just push uh, to origin. So yeah, you need to force it. And uh, after that, you just go in your repo and you submit your, your pull request out of it. So this is the way that, that we uh, actually just create code and create pull request. Now, now when you want to, if you're on the other side and uh, you want to merge a, a branch, uh, so you go, obviously, you go through the code review. That happens into the, uh, the pull request. You have to look at to me and to actually uh, merge the changes. So the first thing I do is uh, I squash the commits, and this is optional. Typically, we decide to do it or not. Uh, we, we we try to do that to keep, like I said, to keep the history of master as clean as possible. So that when you look at when you do git log on it, every commit actually represents like unit of work or a feature. You know, instead of you know, a merge commit. So it's, it's a lot easier to actually read your, your Git log when you do that. Again, it's, it's totally debatable. Um, so squashing, so you've done it. Anyone else has, has done some squashing? It's a little bit tricky. To do. So what you want to do is, uh, you want to uh, to tell uh, Git to actually, you know, from this commit to this commit, you want to uh, squash them together. So uh, you need to give it the, the range of commits that you want to squash together. So what typically this is going to be the place where you actually uh, forge from master, because this is the this is the last commit or first commit, you know, where where you actually forge from um, uh, from master. And uh, you can actually find that commit using the merge base uh, command. So 
to do git merge base, my branch master, it's going to be uh, hash, that's going to be the, the first commit. Uh, and then you can do a git base dash i for interactive. And uh, when you branch with that, uh, with that hash. Or you can say squash, you know, the last n commits using head tilt syntax. Now, when you do that, since it's interactive, it's going to present you a screen like that. So in this example, there was two commits, for example. And uh, it presents you with uh, pick and pick, so you end up in the editor. And you see that. And what you can do is actually decide the action that you, that you want to apply uh, on each commit. And the way it works is that you, typically you're going to merge all the commits into the first one. So you're going to keep the first one as a pick. And then you're going to use the S for squash. You're going to replace the pick by squash for each one. Or you can just put S there. So you're going to end up with this. So pick, squash. And then if you have 10 commits, you're going to squash, 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 squash. You save that. It's going to present you a second screen. And it's going to merge the actual commit log. Uh, so you can actually edit it there if you want. And you can add the last comment that says you know, solves whatever ticket number or whatever. You don't you don't lose the the uh, the uh, the logs the the, the the log for each commit, so it, it creates one file that's going to put it in that commit. And uh, yeah, so typically what I'm going to add is uh, maybe I'm going to change the first line to change the description to have like a better description. The last line I'm going to say you know closes one two three four, and when you do that and you uh, uh, push that, then it's automatically going to close the issue that's associated. That pull request. It's pretty, pretty cool. Now, once I've done that, typically I'm going to rebase again because you know, work happened and master changes. So I'm going to do that. Uh, just rebase one more, uh, once more, and then uh, push uh, push that work to that, that commit. And I need to say dash f again to force it because I did it history because it's a rebase operation in the end. Uh, and uh, after that, I'm going to merge. So this is a workflow where the merge you actually do with Git on the command line and not to merge button on, on GitHub because the merge button actually create a merge commit and all that. So you want to avoid that. I want to avoid that. Um, so you actually just you know Git checkout master, Git merge the feature I just squash and rebase. And then when you push that upstream, then automatically it's going to close the PR. So it's going to say, I'm not closed, but it's going to mark the PR as merge because uh, GitHub has detected that, you, that it was merged, actually. And, uh, and that's it. So the other steps are backporting. So since I've squashed my branch into a single commit. It's very easy to actually backport that commit if I need to to other branches. I just need to cherry pick. So I just you know go into that uh, uh, that branch, get cherry pick with the, the hash with the hash of that single commit. Now there might be you know conflicts I need to resolve. Maybe maybe not, but uh, it's it's quite easy to do. Um. Yeah, so that's so we've done some work, we've reviewed and uh, merged some work. Now, the act of reviewing a PR, uh, so using that uh, that PR alias that uh, that I've shown you. Uh, so when you do that, you can actually pull in some work that's you know, someone submitted as a, as a pull request. Um, work on it and maybe uh, add commits to it. You want to fix something. So you can do that. So again, I always start by rebasing. Uh, I may add, creates, uh, add commits uh, to that, that, that PR branch. Um, I, I merge that, just like I've merged uh, before. I can squash, optionally, and merge on master the same way, and push upstream. 
So uh, it's pretty much the same operation. Uh, but uh, this uh, git pr alias is very useful. Backporting, same idea. Uh, and, um, so, any question about uh, workflow? So again, again, this is this is the workflow that we use. It may or may not fit with what you guys use, but I I thought it might be useful to actually present it and give you some idea on how to define your own workflow. So you know, workflow tend to tend to happen as your team grow. So when you're when you're alone, you're just a few people. You may not need workflow, and everybody just pushes in and master, and that's it. You know, it's the, the less friction kind of uh, of work, of course. But uh, as your team grows, uh, sometimes it's it's useful to actually put a process where you can have a pull review through the pull request. Um, Uh, yeah, that's, that's about what I wanted to, uh, to present today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my God. So it's a good question. So I'm trying. Very hard, and it's against my nature sometimes. But I'm trying very hard to create the smallest possible branches and pull requests to, to make you know as small bite size to make it easier for the reviewer to actually review the code. Because when it's very very long and there's lots of changes that touches a lot of code, it's very hard for the reviewer to review and to test everything. It's it's super hard actually. And and since we we do have a process of you know doing a good review when and you know for us reviewing is you know starting from the, the syntax from the style down to does it actually do what it's supposed to do and uh, you know so we actually spend a lot of time reviewing um, so big PR big review and as a reviewer when I see a big PR I'm like oh. Okay, I need to deep dive into that, and it may take, take me, you know, one, two, or three days to actually do a review. It can be, it can be, it can take a lot of time. It's the review. So, so I try to make as small as possible uh, a request. Now, I, I sometimes so I have a few big pull requests under my belt, like like hundreds of commits, 150 or something like that. And that end up like like with another hundreds of comments, like maybe 150, 200 comments. It's it's too big. It's hard to follow. You know, you know. At some point, it just, it just get too big that it's no, nobody knows where we're at. So what we do in these situations is that we tend to like close it, reopen it with a fresh because okay, so we've nailed that, we've nailed that. Now there's all the this spending. Let's close it and reopen a new one so that it's get a cleaner. Uh, discussion. So, in in that case, big PRs fail. So 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 you're you're better off adding smaller PRs. Now, the other issue that you're going to face is that if you have a, you know, if you change a lot of code and you decide to create smaller PRs, then you're going to have PRs that depends you know, or branches that depends on other branches. Because you move forward in time, and, and sometimes you know you create a branch, you fix something. Now you create another branch. It depends on this work, and and so on. So you can have like a dependency chain like that of, of branches and pull requests, and it can become like a, a train wreck at some point because you know oh this changes and you need to fix that. Then everything else you know behind it is uh, to change and adapt and, and you know, resolve the conflict. So. I mean, there's no there's no silver bullet, silver bullet but uh, but typically smaller pull requests and branches are better. Yeah. Well, no, there, I, I guess there, there's, 
there's no rules there. It really depends on, on what. So th there's two sides. I mean, there's there's when you create a PR, there's different type of PR. You can have like a prototype, proof of concept, work in progress PR, and and so what we've came up with is that we and as as you know as the one creating the pull request, yes, we 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 have to describe what what uh, what we um, expect from the reviewers. So don't spend time on the you know on the look of the code. It's just you know a proof of concept. Just tell me what you think about the idea. Right, so so we 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 try to set expectations in terms of, uh, of, of what we expect for the reviewers. So there's a difference between a proof of concept and a ready to merge. So um, so you know, ready to merge for us is very important that you know code quality is there, and and very often we're not going to have design discussion in ready to merge PR. These would have happened before. You know, in the prototype, or maybe in an issue where you create an issue and say, "Oh, we should do that, do that," and then we're going to have a discussion in there. And then when we, you know, we we agree on the direction, and then we're going to become code and eventually uh, ready to push PR. And then at that point, it's going to be more, you know, did you think about this edge case and so on, right? So, but uh, there's no rules on the time you spend on pull request. But obviously, the bigger the, you know. The bigger PR, the longer it takes to review. Questions, comments? All right, so that's that's all I have for you guys today.